some rousing talks from Margaret Haynes and Jose Marie Griffith and many of you in the room here. And when the day ended, my head was just swimming with new ideas for how I could support my librarians' research. First, I have to figure out how to get them all sabbatical. <laughs> so, I'm really looking forward to seeing Jose Marie's ROI calculator and seeing how the, whether that applies to my library setting, how I can use it. It sounds like it'll be a great tool. So today, it's my pleasure to get us off to another great start and uh, introduce our keynote speaker, Rowena Cullen. Rowena is the Associate Professor in the School of Information Management at Victoria University in Wellington, New Zealand, one of my all-time favorite places. Uh, she's a native New Zealander and was educated in New Zealand and at Edinburgh. She's a person of an incredible array of interests and talents, as you will see from just looking at her bio in the program. Those of us in health sciences libraries may know her research about assessing the quality and access to online health information and her recent book, Health Information on the Internet. But now she's focusing on yet another area, e-government, with another book just out on that subject. And in my conversation with her last evening, we quickly moved to the topic of privacy and personal health information, which showed me how these fields are really more congruent than one might initially think. But her underlying interests in all of her areas of research are in what kind of information people seek, how well those needs are met, and how they're measured. And she tells me that in her spare time, she enjoys the spectacular beaches of New Zealand and the trails. I can't imagine that she really has any spare time. So please join me now in welcoming Rowena Cullen to speak about evidence and e-government. Thank you very much indeed, Carol. I have to get rid of my little Vix lozenge. I'm just sitting there listening to Carol thinking, oh, this is interesting. Oh, this is me. <laughs> I forgot that I needed to get rid of it. So I'll do that. I'll also start my talk by, by saying, why e-government? How did I get into e-government? Because one of the comments which is often made about my work is that it's very eclectic and ranges across a very wide range of subjects. Well, I got into e-government basically from GovPubs, which a number of you here will know is a, it's a classic course in the American MLS degree. Peter Hernan was visiting New Zealand um, many years ago as a, a visiting professor for a year when we failed to make an appointment. And he did some work for the National Library on the repository scheme or depository scheme of government publications in public and academic libraries around the country because we could all see that with the internet coming we were going to see some changes in what happened with government publications. When he departed from New Zealand I agreed to take over that work, try and keep it going, try and keep the research going and, and looking around and looking at the way government information was migrating to the internet I decided that what I would do is do an investigation of government websites. That was the first piece of e-government work that I did, developed some software um, with a talented IT assistant where we could look at about um, 90, I think 90 government websites, put the data into a database and then analyse it. And that was immediately picked up by the government information quarterly. And I moved on to do local government websites as well, looking at primarily at usability and communication with users and um, content issues a little bit and so on. And um, from that point on, I want to talk to people about what they did about e-government, how did they use it, how did they use it. Started doing a lot of focus groups, interviews and surveys. And when Peter came back to New Zealand to do another research stint with us, he and I set out around the countryside um, meeting all kinds of groups. It, it took him to all kinds of strange places he'd never been, meeting people that he'd never expect, expected to meet, women in dairying, a local Maori tribe, all sorts of people. And out of those interviews came the report Wired for Wellbeing, which is on our government website and which formed the basis of the book on e-government that we later produced together. So it really comes out of a very classic area of librarianship, government publications, government information, and it takes you into a whole new world of user studies. 
So having said that, let's move on to, to uh, a quite esoteric talk in some ways about how you can try and philosophically pull together such diverse strands as evidence-based practice, government information, government services, e-government, and, uh, and good information management practices, which is what we're all about. So in the talk, what I want to do first is, is just cover a little bit about e-government because although I'm very familiar with the concept, not everybody here will really have a very grounded concept of what have heard of it, probably. So let's just look at some of the models of e-government that are around, including Peter's. And then to try and pull the strands together, I then want to go right back to the early days of um, evidence-based medicine and the nature of evidence and evidence-based practice in the health sector. Then go back to e-government and look at how do they evaluate what they're doing at the current time? How do people evaluate government services? And whether an evidence-based concept would improve that. And then finally, um, to put before you a model of integrated service development that I have added an evaluation dimension to, which I hope will better promote the use of e-government, uh, evidence in e-government. And I think that in doing all that, there might be many things there that resonate with this audience about how you could apply it to library and information service practice, because for most of us, we are still in the public sector, working within government structures of various kinds and within administrative structures which are very close to, to the constraints of the public sector. And I think a number of people made reference to that yesterday. The other thing that I want to say as I begin this talk is that e-government is so new, nobody there at the stage of looking at evidence and implementing evidence. We're still at the stage of thinking, what should we be investigating? What is this literature going to be about? How are we going to measure? And implementation, I think, is going to be quite some way down the track. So what is e-government? Well, a definition that I use in my classes on e-government is just is fairly standard, the use by government agencies. Agencies is a word that's used a great deal in the public sector, of course, meaning individual departments, ministries, um, state-owned enterprises, all those quangos and sort of things that hang off. Agencies is a really sort of um, umbrella word that covers them all. The use by these agencies of information communications technologies that have the ability to transform relations with citizens, businesses and other arms of government. And that's where you start coming into this classic um, little model of G to C, which is often written G to C, G to B and G to G that comes up a little bit in this talk. Now a number of, of um, international bodies have got involved in e-government development and um, the OECD is one. And an interesting paper by Elizabeth Muller for the OECD talks about how you would define e-government. And again, the basic definition, ICTs to achieve better government. She suggests it's more about government than e. And I think that's quite an important lesson to remember. Now we're talking about e-learning or e-services in libraries. We're actually talking more about learning than e. And it's easy to forget that. So it's really important to think about what we're talking about here is good government. And she suggests that the guidelines are, first of all, leadership, the vision and political will. And that's true of, of all the sorts of areas we're talking about when we're talking about evidence-based practice. Common frameworks for cooperation. A major problem of government is the silo mentality that in inhabits either national governments, state governments and local governments between different ministries, different departments and the sharing of information. So a, a precursor for effective e-government she defines as those frameworks that support cooperation. A customer focus is the next element that's really important. Customer focus and responsibility, the accountability for serving customers well. And for some of us that's quite new in government. Online consultation is doing a lot of work at the moment in New Zealand about trying to um, measure how people feel about e-participation, taking part in online forums to develop government policy. A very, very new thing, turning out to be very hard to measure because it's so tiny you can hardly actually detect it and go out and talk to the people engaged in it. And finally, international cooperation. 
And um, an example of that for those of us who did travel into the States on electronic passports would be the data sharing that goes on as you travel around the world between our, our immigration people and immigration people here in the States. So that's an example of e-government supporting international cooperation for identification of travellers. So this is a model developed by Peter Hernan that appears in our book. And it's actually it's quite useful. Um, first of all, we have this, this model up in the top right-hand corner, G to G, G to B, and G to C. We also say the e-government is about local, state, and federal governments, whatever your system is. It's about governance. How do we manage our society? How can citizens participate in the way governments function? It's also about e-compliance, the regulations, and, and quite a number of the early case studies in e-government turn out to be about e-compliance, making it easier for people to file um, lading bills and all sorts of things. So one very good example in my country is when people want to export um, produce, flowers and kiwi fruit and all the sorts of things that arrive in the States when we've got summer and you've got winter, they have to be cleared by agriculture as well as cleared by customs. And by putting this together online, we've got a very effective and rapid system, which means that the daffodils get to you before they've quite wilted. So e-compliance with regulations is one area in which we've seen quite strong developments in e-government. We've also got the area of e-procurement. Governments need to buy stuff from furniture to paper to printers to computers to building bridges and all sorts of things. And that's another area where you're seeing massive strides in e-government. The tenders go out online through some kind of formalised system, bids are placed online. And I'm, I'm having studied and worked in Japan for the past three months. Not so long ago, I noticed that that was one area where Japan was finding, because they were trying to deal with levels of corruption in the contracting business, that putting this into an e-procurement framework was helping make this, the system both more transparent and less liable to corruption. And that's probably something that's happening here in the States too, where you have some of those problems. We've got service delivery. A little slower to get off the ground, actually, just a slightly harder task. We've got government involved in e-commerce, the trading aspects of government, and emergency response. People, Peter wants to call this homeland security. I said, well, that's a very US concept. Let's look at Singapore, where maybe you've got bird flu as the issue, or SARS, because they were building web pages for, to give people information, all the information they needed to know about SARS and bird flu. So we settled on emergency response, but if you actually look around the world, you find most countries have got something to do with e-government in that area. And then there's, down the bottom, there's the bit that we started with, information services your access to policy documents, to legislation, to all the kinds of information that in a modern democratic state we're used to having access to. So that's e-government. And then in the top left-hand corner, Peter talks about some of the ways in which you could measure this, whether it's about productivity, whether it's about protection of privacy, whether it's about effectiveness and cost-effectiveness, security, and so on. So a lot of things there to measure, and a lot of ways in which you can see, ah, well, how would we gather evidence? Just before I move off uh, these models of e-government, it's worth looking at, at, at another model that's been suggested. The, this, I don't think that Lane and Lee, and the references that I've used here will be at the end of the PowerPoints um, when they go up online. They weren't the first people to come up with a sort of fourth stage, but they've become the one that's been referred to most. So they identified, quite some years ago, looking at the way e-government was developing from the catalogue stage through to horizontal integration. And this is really important as a model because it tells us what we're actually aiming to achieve down at the horizontal integration level. So we go from being, the government has a website, and there will be many countries in the world still where there's not much beyond a few levels of pages down. The government has a website, a bit of information online, even if it's just where you can contact a certain office and downloadable printable forms. But when you move to the transaction level, you're able to complete that form and, and submit it online. And obviously behind the working database, which is collecting data. Vertical integration, you've got within, say, one ministry, some simple tasks down the bottom, leading up to major policy developments. And so the whole 
government agency, you've got actually systems talking to each other. Now that is starting to get into the too hard basket for a lot of agencies. You don't see a lot of examples of that in the case studies emerging in the literature. And the second one, the, the, the fourth element, horizontal integration is where the cutting edge of e-government is now. Trying to integrate different agency systems across functions and, and building the, the holy grail of e-government is always this one-stop shop. Whether it really is achievable and the most effective approach is another matter. This is something where evidence has not been to the fore. It's become the mantra. But to do it, you need all the things that make interoperability work. You need common technologies, you need common languages, and much of the work that is going on at the cutting edge of e-government today is not about the technical interoperability. That's not too difficult to achieve, and there are very good international standards. It's about language. It's about naming things. And everybody in the health sector knows just how difficult that is with the universal medical language system, SNOMED and so on, and getting to systems to talk to each other. Well, now you just multiply that across government, and you can see quite how hard the task is. Added to that, you've got the question of changing culture so that agencies talk to each other and, and, and unify their systems. So that's the hard one, but again, something where we really need some evidence to help us move forward and resolve these problems. So what we've got in e-government is very rapid development over the past decade or so, driven by citizen expectations, because for those of you who do your shopping online and book your airline tickets online, you have a very rapidly rising expectation of what you can do with government. We have a very competitive international environment. It's quite um, astounding when you look sometimes at the way governments are judging their success in e-government and the amount of attention that they pay to some rather inadequate ranking systems of where they're sitting in the world. You know, I can tell you on each ranking whether New Zealand is 10th or 13th and I discuss this with people down at State Services e-government unit and, you know, America prides itself on coming number one in something and then, oh goodness, you slipped to number three in another ranking. I don't think that there are areas in health delivery, education delivery, where we rank each other in this way, but somehow it's become part of the e-government world and it is a driver for future development. Having said that, the focus in the almost all developed countries is on transformation of government. Now, I'm, I'm trying to write a paper for a new book on e-government which actually tries to analyse what, what do people mean by transformation. Nobody articulates it. Everybody wants to transform government through the use of ICTs, but nobody knows what transformation will look like. Another area where we have no evidence, no really serious thinking about what we're trying to achieve. And within this environment, concepts of measurement and evaluation have really lagged behind and are very, very basic. So, the use of evidence in the evaluation process is even more lacking. And really that raises the question, how can we measure the effectiveness of e-government systems and services? On what basis should we be moving forward in these various developments? What is the role of evidence in decision making in government? So this leads me to, my, to the central part of my talk. What is evidence-based e-government? Well, it's actually very difficult to define evidence-based practice in this domain. And one of the reasons is that policy-making is often more political than scientific. If it's hard in medicine, and, and it was quite a, a big ask to actually, it took about a decade or more to get the medical fraternity to basically accept that they should be using evidence-based practice and, and trying to implement it. And it's even harder in librarianship. In the world of government, we have got so many different drivers. We've got political parties which start their policy making at the kind of national convention level or the branch level. We've got politicians who've had pet theories and dreams for years. We have, in many countries in the world, less so in the States, but in many countries of Europe, and um, in the Commonwealth. We have coalition governments where different party agendas are coming together. And we've got to put all this together with a bureaucracy which has got its own agendas and, and drivers and which is pushing for policy that fulfil those things because they've been working away for 20 years and governments come and go. 
And in this environment, we're starting to talk about evidence. So you can see that, that policy making is a fragile and, and difficult animal to analyse, and that where we start to introduce concepts of evidence, we're going to have to constantly deal with the political. So I thought that, that just to develop some thinking on this, I'd go back to first principles and go back to the original concept from EBM. And the definition that appeared in the first handbook by Sackett, which is still there, they, it really works well for people. I find it really works well in, in training young medica, um, medical students. The conscientious, explicit and judicious use of current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. And start moving from there. So we've got integrating individual clinical expertise with the best available external clinical evidence from systematic research. Other definitions use words like best practice, application of scientific method, objective tests of efficacy. But in the field of e-government, I'm not sure what best practice is. We often decide on what's best practice, but on no basis of evidence at all. So let's look at the one of the standard um, definitions used in evidence-based librarianship and that promoted by Andrew when he came to New Zealand to a Lianza conference, that's our um, library association, um, and gave a talk on evidence-based librarianship in a workshop there in the year 2000. And this is shifting a little bit away but the same elements as the original Sackett definition. An approach to information science that promotes the collection, interpretation and integration of valid, important, applicable, user-reported, librarian-observed and research-derived evidence. And then in the, completing the definition, Andrew said, moderate the best available evidence moderated by user needs and preferences to improve the quality of professional judgments. Now that's something that you can see will work with e-government. So let's have a look at the definition. Well, the modification that happened between those two definitions is that really suggests to me that evidence doesn't necessarily imply the use of the RCT gold standard. This may not be the appropriate protocol, particularly within government. And that's largely because, don't forget, that in this definition we're not talking about the political process of government and policy making. We're actually talking about where is our scientific evidence about what works and what doesn't. Then we can deal with the politics and we've got some science. But the difficulty is the number of variables involved and the nature of the intervention, defining the intervention that a government is making. So isolating a single intervention to even measure. And what classically happens within government, of course, is you have a policy that's sort of working. You tweak it here, you tweak it there, you tweak it somewhere else. And nobody measures it for some years. And then they don't know which of those changes was the one that actually had the impact. And they don't know either if because, you know, the change was because the economy was growing. Or if there was a downturn in employment, was it because of some major manufacturing shift in the region? So we've got some comple complex variables to measure there. And it's very difficult to I isolate and identify an intervention. But to some extent, the evidence-based medicine model recognises this in its levels of evidence. And although RCTs may sit at the top of the levels of evidence, there are some much more accessible models of research which, being aware that they're not the gold standard, can still be used. And that's what I take from the levels of evidence. And I notice also in the new critical appraisal protocol, I was very pleased to see this change because I go back to the Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine website regularly for teaching purposes and so on and try and stay up to date with changes there. That the critical appraisal worksheets, which I take off that and work through with my students, now contain sections at the bottom which say, does this treatment fit within my patient's preferences and my own clinical understanding of the nature of this disease? And that brings into play this, this model that allows us to say, here is some evidence, here is the environment that we're working in, here are the user preferences. So we've still got, we can, we can develop a model here which really can work, I think, in the government sphere. Because we've still got the word judicious, which allows a lot of um, personal wisdom to come into play. And we've still got in integrating clinical expertise in place. And I would also suggest that the sector, 
both in the library information world and in the government could benefit from the use of the structured question. Whether you define it as PICO or whether you've got your own refinement of that, but defining a population that you're investigating, an intervention that you can identify and isolate, some form of comparison of outcomes is actually a very good research model to be promoting within government. And I, this diagram, which came from the old Health Information Research Unit at McMaster, and which appeared in one of the early newsletters, and I've, is lost from the web. Um, it's not a most stable environment, I suppose, the internet still, which I picked up on one of my first missions to investigate this topic in the United States and Canada many, many years ago, at least a decade ago when I first met Joanne. And I took this back and I've used it in teaching ever since and a lot of my medical library colleagues also find it very helpful in teaching. So that's pulling together really what I've just been saying, that, that um, tripartite approach. And what I want to argue is that not only is this model appropriate for healthcare, but for public policy development, for library and information services and for e-government, as long as we can find appropriate evidence and evaluate appropriate evidence. And that depends on the nature of the question and the evidence being sought. And that I don't find uh, people researching e-government and e-government evaluation, I don't find them investigating that question at all, asking why they're posing certain questions. But if we're going to focus on an intervention, then we can start applying levels of evidence to see if that intervention is effective in achieving stated goals. So in, in medicine, I'm sorry that little extra bold bit there, um, in medicine this might be a stated, a predetermined level of alleviation of symptoms and reduction in risk. In library and information services and e-government it might be faster service, but again we should try and predetermine the criteria by which we're judging. We still, I think, are very, very prone to post hoc criteria. And that's a lesson I think that we can learn from the evidence-based medicine model. Predetermined criteria and then you can really talk about having found some evidence. But we might be looking at things like faster service, what levels are we trying to achieve, wider reach of service, meeting needs, but we need to know exactly which needs we've met, not just go and ask people afterwards, and try and address that question of cost effectiveness. And I was very impressed with a um, talk yesterday, lunchtime, about return on investment and, and measuring costs. I think I'm going to really study that and see how much it can be applied to e-government as well as LIS. So what we've got here, we've got a model of evidence-based practice which we think we can apply to e-government about rigorous scientific evidence, preference of stakeholders. And I want to broader out here from patients, customers to stakeholders in government. We've got a mix of those things with professional knowledge and we can accommodate our political determinants. But it still requires the most rigorous evidence of efficacy. And I, th I think when I was researching this paper, I came across Peter Brophy's paper, from, which is published in the journal. He was talking about narrative and narrative-based practice. And I think it was a bit of an apologetic. And um, some of you may want to take issue with me on this, but I thought that Peter was sort of saying, we should listen to our own narratives as professionals. And I thought, well, that was just a little bit naughty, Peter, because Tricia Greenhalgh, who started writing about narrative-based um, practice was talking about the patient, it was talking about meaning for the patient and I want to take that out of it and say well Peter we'll just hang on there, I'm sure that there's lots of interesting stories to tell but we're actually here in an evidence based context, let's leave that aside, that's our professional expertise but when we talk about narrative let's talk about the meaning for the citizen of their role as a citizen. And in fact, at the end of that um, Wired for Wellbeing report, and it, it is in the book on e-government, Peter and I reached the conclusion that citizens interact with government with many, many hats on. And on any one day, the way you interact with government may be as a parent, trying to find out something about schools in the region or some policy about schools that you're concerned with. You may be um, a patient in a state healthcare system or seeking some kind of medical insurance. You may be a lobbyist about an environmental issue in your region. You may have take, be taking an interest in the democratic primaries and want to get information about that or information about some law that you heard somebody mention. So that any, on any one day you can be changing hats 
and certainly within a lifetime you will play many different roles in relation to government. And that, I think, is where narrative is really important, understanding those relationships citizens have with government, because we will never get citizen-centric government if we don't understand that a lot better. So I want to go back to Greenhalgh and her holistic phenomenological approach, balancing objectivity and subjectivity. And I think that there is a role for professional ex expertise and narrative in that, as Peter suggests, but that we need to focus first on our users. And I think if we do that, then we place the citizen at the centre of e-government evaluation. And I think that's a necessary precondition for citizen-centric government and transformation. If we're looking for transformation, I think that's where we'll see it. So for those of you who are less familiar with the levels of evidence, don't teach it on a sort of a yearly basis. I've got a simplified version here, which I don't really want to go through in great detail, but I may need to come back to later on. And at the very top, we've got the systematic review of RCTs. Following that, we've got one RCT, and also in the first category, all or non none studies, which may be a term unfamiliar to some of you. An all or none study is a study in which previously all the patients died, and now some live, or previously some of the patients died and now none do. Now that's actually a model that I think you could probably use in government with a bit of transformation. Then we've got systematic reviews at the second level with homogeneity, that is of similar, similar sorts of studies, cohort studies and non-randomised trials. We've got below that cohort studies, outcome studies, systematic reviews, individual case control. That's a model we could probably use we can't randomise necessarily, but we can sometimes use case control. And I see quite a lot of that in the LIS literature and evidence literature now. Case series studies following through. And then the expert opinion based on bench research or first principles. This is a Delphi-type model. Now, how relevant are all these models to evaluation methods? Well, in the library world, in the evidence-based library practice, and now EBLIP, world, research to date has tended to focus on information literacy for this reason. And I'm very pleased to see actually that this conference has got a much broader scope and that people are actually taking that model out into lots of other areas like collection management and management and all sorts of other things. But I think it was because it was so easy to Id identify an intervention that people first of all got stuck into that and did some really good work. Now we need to try and isolate interventions in library practice. And if you make a change, stop beforehand, do some measurement, and then see if you can, after your intervention, see a change. Because that's what we fail to do. We do pre- and post-testing and information literacy training, but we fail to do pre- and post-testing when we introduce other changes in our service. So it helps us in this model to clarify exactly what we're trying to evaluate and isolate that intervention and to define the population. Now, for those of you who do marketing, of course, you're very used to this and segmenting your markets and looking at them differently. So, you know, defining populations is really important. And then moving on to identify other variables which may impact on the outcome we're seeking to achieve. And this is where it gets really difficult for government. But difficult is not an excuse for not trying. And then thinking about what kind of evidence we're likely to find, what, what we can find in past studies if we actually look through them really carefully. So the, the concept of a systematic review within government is really quite absent. Policy analysts have ways of seeking information. They do review the literature. But at the level of a systematic review, I think that they're just not trained in that, that depth of analysis. So RCTs might not be possible in all areas, particularly in government, but what is? Well, evaluation in the public sector, um, and it's not that they haven't evaluated in the past. They use a variety of frameworks and questions. First of all, there's the descriptive environment. And in the descriptive environment, you might get an evaluation of a new policy on, say, transport or health services or something. You look at goals, you look at the process, you look at whether you've successfully implemented, you know, have you finished with the process, you look at how you went about it, how did you turn policy into practice. You might look at who were the stakeholders, were all their concerns addressed, were they all consulted, who was responsible. 
his responsibility shifted as the policy became practice. Did we determine the outcomes before we implemented? Do we know what we're trying to achieve? And then, I mean, in later methods, of course, you get the goals compared with the outcomes. You also find quite a lot of formative evaluation. Sometimes pilot programs take place, or testing of a, in a small set of the population, um, sometimes in one region, following up on a descriptive evaluation, seeking improvements in goal setting and trying a policy in one area before it becomes a national policy. And formative evaluation is often iterative and, and, and might go through several iterations before we fully develop a policy or a programme. And I'm talking here about social work programmes, health programmes, immunisation programmes, all sorts of things. Then there is a normative form, which is standards-based against norms. This is usually used to investigate goals and their appropriateness, the targets set. And how are those targets derived? And how do they go against targets set in other countries, other jurisdictions? Were they achievable? And if looking around in the literature for some form of standard... And you get this, for example, World Health Organization has got lots and lots of standards about the burden of disease and, and health interventions and so on. And, and in many other areas there are similar standards in the field of government. And the World Bank has got a very good model about the, how to assess intervention in developing countries and clear clarity in setting goals and measurement against goals. And their, their literature is often quite useful to bring back to um, the developed world, actually, because they talk a lot of sense. And people like Richard Heeks, who's written a great deal about e-government and very much about project success and success and failure and critical success factors and projects in the developed world, actually it's a very good model to apply to e-government projects in our world, in the developed world, because they often are the same critical success factors. Then we've got process evaluation is another model. Is the program being delivered as it was hoped to be? And do, does it reflect policy? It's quite often difficult to reflect government policy in a programme. And it, it, as I'm saying these things, start thinking about libraries, you know. You have a new policy, you have some missions and goals, but, but the actual translation of those into actual practice and deliverables is sometimes gets a little bit muddled, muddled in that world too. And then we have to think about impacts and outcomes. And, in many countries, the model in recent years, over the past 20 years, has been to look at social outcomes for individuals and for society as a whole of government interventions and trying to measure what difference it made. And again, that's when we get so many variables and economies changing and world situations changing and um, the political and economic agenda changing. It becomes very difficult to assess these things. So the methods that people use, well, there's a lot of benchmarking goes on. You can benchmark infrastructure. I've been very pleased to see how much libraries are starting to use benchmarking, and I'm a great believer in process benchmarking. You know, we benchmark the statistics a lot. In most countries, you'll find that you've got statistics of academic libraries, how many books, how many staff, and so on. But let's look at process and, and try and talk to each other about how we do things and develop best practice from that. So we've also got particularly in the European framework. I don't see them as much in this part of the world, but the government-sanctioned or industry-based best value performance indicators, well, you do see them here that Accenture, I think, is a US-based firm. They've got a value model for the public sector. The UK's got its best value performance indicators. The EU has some basic public service measures for e-government. They've decided these are best value and these are the things they're going to measure. Um, there's not a lot of evidence behind it actually, but they're quite. A, I'll come back to them in a little bit more detail later. Then we've got our quantitative measures. You've got surveys, you've got user studies, you've got uptake counts. Um, web metrics comes into that too. And then the more sophisticated cost benefit analysis and trying to look at cost effectiveness of programs. Um, the cost side is a lot easier than the benefits in e government. But many of these depend on the question being asked and the validity of the question. Is it the right question? Have we, have we got our question right? Is it properly structured? So if you're moving through this, and I'll come to my model shortly, we've got in policy and evaluation, we really need to know whether programs are doing what they're intended to do. But you find in e-government that people actually haven't stopped and thought first. 
what they intended to do. They just were putting stuff up online. We're going to have a new website. We've got to have a website. Everybody else has got a website. What are we going to put on our website? But the actual objective is not clarified in most agencies. And then we have to look also when we've got policies. We've got actually to, to try and identify whether the outcome's due to some other factor. I mean, it's a, it's a very well-known truism in government that if you actually have programs to alleviate unemployment, you actually have to weigh success of programs against an increasing job market. I mean, maybe the economy took a turn for the better and the job market increased anyway. So how much was due to that? How much was due to your program? How much did your program contribute to that? It's really very difficult to know. And the other thing that happens in government is that many, many policy programs have unforeseen consequences. Um, one is perverse incentives which is where you set a, a subsidy and you see the wrong people coming in or you're actually subsidising people to do more of the same. In New Zealand, we've just moved from paying family practitioners, GPs, to see a patient so much per head, the general medical services benefit, to a capitation system whereby you have to identify all the people who belong to your practice, you get a certain amount of money to keep them in good health, and the incentive, therefore, is to make them well, not to have them back next week. And the turning that around is supposed to get better value out of a health sector. We have yet to measure if it does. But that's a perverse incentive. The incentive to the doctor was because doctors need to make a profit and start a business, um, was to have the patient back. That was income generation. And, of course, if you're a kindly doctor, of course you want to see your patient every week. The other thing is middle class capture, you know, programs which the, the, and I don't think there's anything wrong with middle class capture, I mean middle class people are just more motivated, often more aware, read newspapers, become aware of programs more, they often gain a big, bigger benefit than the, the actual, the disadvantaged populations that such programs are intended to reach, if they're harder to reach, harder to get the information out. So we have to think about those sorts of things. We also have to think about, are we looking for causation? What happens at the, at the beginning level? Or are we looking at impact of a program? And if we're going to talk about causation, then we're back in the medical model. We've got to identify and eliminate other confounding variables that might have affected the situation. And if we're going to look at impact, we need to follow through all the consequences be alert to the negative as well as the positive. And it reminds me, and um, I haven't done these references, I actually wrote a fuller paper here, which I haven't decided what to do yet with, that there's a classic story in the medical literature of the use of um, a drug to reduce blood pressure, and Joanne can probably got it at the top of her head, the tip of her tongue, where the, when they looked at the indicators for success, they set the criteria reduction in blood pressure, that was fine, um, but they failed to look at the other impact that the drug was having, and that was an increased death rate. So the patients, you know, they were, they were achieving success in one dimension, and it took some years before they turned around and thought, ooh, whoops, more people are actually dying on this drug. <laughs> so we might be reducing blood pressure, but something else here is going on. And for those of you who want it, I'll find the reference. I have got it in the written paper. And, you know, that's, um, that brought people up short made people think really, really hard about looking at all the consequences. And that, again, is in the critical appraisal protocol. Look at all the consequences. Now, government programs, again, find it really difficult to do that. Have you thought about that when you introduce an innovation in your library services, looking at all the impacts of the service you're introducing? So let's move into the, the final phase of this. Governments are concerned with and want to measure policy development and control, managing their policies, making sure policies are working. Control is used a lot in, in policy and management terms and it just means measuring and so on. We need to look at infrastructure and agency readiness for e-government. There's a lot of measuring going on there. How much telecommunication infrastructure have you got? Have you got the skill level you need in your country to really move right through local government to good e-government? Do we have the human resource base as well as the telecommunications base? Do we have enough people connected to the internet in our country to make it worth the investment? Then we've got, we need to measure the provision of service to citizens. Here we are back to our G to C. The provision of service to businesses, 
as one of the success areas of e-government in most countries, and internal government functioning, agency talking to agency, G to G. And then finally, where there's a lot of interest now, e-democracy and e-participation, that consultation online, that, um, that use of the internet to get the discussions going that inform democracy. So let's come back to some of the ways the, this happens. Well, e-government readiness is measured both by the UN and um, Daniel West in his Daryl West, sorry, in his Brown University rankin, rankings. UNPAN, that's United Nations Program for Networking, I think, ranks all UN members using a, a composite, composite index based on website assessment, telecommunication infrastructure, human resource endowment and they surveyed just for every single member of the UN. The Brown University rankings, which are published each year, they select certain sites, key sites in each jurisdiction, such as Parliament, the Legislative, Judiciary, Cabinet if it has a website, major agencies. And then on these they've got three dimensions, of information availability, service deliberate, uh, delivery and public access. And, that, and then they've listed some of the measures they use there such as, you know, can you do a transaction online? Do they have good security privacy statements? Are they, have they got usability, high quality usability, disability access? Can you pay online? All those sorts of things. So they, that's one model. And that really, um, that's using metrics to sort of rank countries and it's a kind of benchmarking. It's sort of useful, but it's not based on a lot of evidence. You know, and, and, and it's quite interesting because I make a comment later on. I might see if I can go back one. I make a comment later on about cultural bias, and one of the criticisms that I've made in the past, and I think others have made of the West, there are West's rankings, is that they've selected taxation and as a major indicator of successfully government. Now, my country objects to this because we just have a system which not everybody has to file a tax return. So it's not one of the first things they want to do. And many of my, in my e-government class, I had a number of Indian students. Now, I don't think that India is at all interested in doing taxation filing online. But what the students told me was the most successful thing in e-government in their country was the fact that you could book a train ticket. You used to have to go down to the station and get in a queue, and about three days later, you might have got to the head of the queue and you got your ticket. And tickets were allocated at various stations up the line, and once you could do it online, this was such a boon. They were so delighted. They all wanted to show me websites of how you could do it and talked about this was transformation for them. So in, in these rankings, you've got to be really careful that you're not culturally biased to certain economies and, and, uh, and so on. Now let's come back to these best value performance indicators. That best value for e-government in the British system requires local governments to report on how many interactions you can do, uh, e-enabled, they call it, and that's providing information, collecting revenue, benefits, consultation, regulations such as licences, booking venues, that's a common one, you know, booking a, a hall or something to have a meeting, resources and courses and so on. And some of these are required, some are recommended and so on. And you might have some of them, they might be include good data warehousing or content management systems. They might have back-end systems that can be measured as well, including geographical information systems, which a lot of local governments are experimenting with, e-procurement systems. And I th the, within the, um, the EU, you've got similar models. Um, I, thought, I think that the, some of these recommended ones are, come out of the EU model as well. But there, there's not a lot of... I can't find in any of these policy documents anything that says this is why we have suggested these measures. They're very much... They're sort of best practice measures developed in committee. So we're right down the bottom of the table of levels of evidence. This is, this is expert opinion, which may be based on... And in the earlier tables were ruder about it than they are now. But this was really just a bunch of people getting together who were enthusiasts, always dangerous, setting standards that countries were then required to comply with, or local government was required to comply with. <coughs> 
So let's have a look at what they should be measuring and how we go about it with an evidence-based model. And you know, Peter makes the comment that the whole purpose of measurement in e-government is to ensure that adequate documentation exists, that is evidence, to support claims of success. If we say we're doing it well, where is the evidence? To enable us to monitor performance over time and to engage in benchmarking. So what he suggests we want to do is measure the impact of changes, and this is in his chapter on evaluating and assessing e-government in the book. Measure the impact of these changes, which I've labelled innovations, on service delivery and uptake, and any gains in efficiency in our processes. And the impacts that would come out of this would be customer satisfaction, increased efficiency, the reduction in both the number of administrative tasks, simplification of administrative tasks, say for e-compliance or um, for transacting with government, so filing a tax return, and a reduction in time. So we've got a considerable saving to citizen there, which we could start measuring in terms of uh, cost effectiveness. And so we need to start producing the evidence to determine what are the targets, what are the benchmarks that we should be applying, because we actually don't know. We're just kind of putting a finger in the wind saying, oh, well, it would be there. You know, what's, how, how wide is the ocean? How high is the sky? I don't know. What do you say? So we need to actually determine the measures that, uh, that also reflect the different roles of government. I talked earlier about the the different hats citizens can wear in relation to government, but governments also have different roles in relation to citizens. And sometimes it's about service provision, sometimes it's about e-democracy, and sometimes because of the level of government it varies quite a bit. And, and as citizens, we just tend to think of government in a, in a box. But in fact, you know, in all jurisdictions, there's clear delineations between who delivers education, who delivers health, who delivers this, and, and so on. So we need some baseline data. So in, in researching this paper, I came across this um, very interesting paper by Constalian Vinter, who analysed a range of e-government evaluation models, and they thought it was very narrowly focused, very piecemeal. Um, people were focusing on quick fix, you know, the low-hanging fruit. Let's do the easy stuff first, and not actually focusing on the transformation issue. There was a scarcity of studies, they said, which related readiness. We've looked at readiness, infrastructure, and back office systems, what happens down there in the basement of the agency to what was going to happen out here in terms of service delivery. We had a current emphasis on customer orientation and integrated services, but we actually didn't know how to measure how we were getting there. And they suggested that if we were going to get there, we needed to have systems for monitoring, evaluating and benchmarking. And they suggested an integrated model. Now, I've taken their model and and kind of redesigned it because I think that this is where we can start putting in an evidence-based evaluation. So they suggest that your environmental maturity, the country, what's going on in terms of broadband access, internet access, how, have you connected your government agencies? Some countries have, some haven't. And so that you've got environment maturity both in the government and in citizens and businesses. We then have to look at our back office systems are standards that are being developed within the government for interoperability, those language issues, um, the systems and the, the IT infrastructure that's actually working within government. And once we've looked at that, we can move forward to the front office. That's the website. And here they, they make a very useful dis dis division between supply side and demand side, which is normally a term used in economics, but it's actually quite a useful term because we've got web interfaces and service integration here, and over here, demand side, we've got the citizen, the customer, with needs and wants and uses and things that they'll do. And then finally, we lead on to impact. What is the impact this has for government in terms of cost, time, the complexity of services they're trying to develop, and for customers? We can measure time it took to complete a transaction or do something or find some information, the convenience that they enjoyed, the accuracy of the service and the information, and that's important too. So we've got there a model where we can st we've taken the whole thing apart and we can actually start looking at where we could measure. Now, in all four domains, you get benchmarking studies and some form of evaluation.
And benchmarking studies can be really interesting because I don't think that they are in themselves high quality evidence, but they can tell us where we can start putting in new interventions and start measuring. So if we go back to this diagram again, we can start seeing, we can start isolating this intervention. And that's what governments have failed to do. They've failed to do one thing at a time and do a pre and post test. They tend to, if they're looking at their website and they want to revamp, they actually change the contractor, go off to another firm. And I mean, I had, after that first set of web evaluations, I had several government agencies come and talk to me about their website and because we'd, we'd got them scored on all different measures and said, that was really interesting, they're going to redevelop it. And I would look at it six months later. And then the redevelopment, because they'd gone to a new firm, They've gone backwards on some things, forward on others, but backwards on some. And I think that's very, very common. That's probably true of your library website too, actually. You go forward on some fronts, back on others. What we need to do is do one change at a time, fix one thing and measure it, and see if that did what we thought it would do, instead of just kind of throwing out the baby and the bathwater and getting a new baby. So that we've actually, because, because the only way we will get evidence is if we can actually just slow it down and change this, look at it, change this, look at it. And isolate the intervention from other confounding factors. So we have to look at research design in the government sector. And we have to look at policy formulation based on user needs. And I haven't, I don't know of any user needs studies in terms of e-government. I know that there have been, we've done user work and, and talked to people but a serious user needs study and it just doesn't exist. So here we've got research designs that reflect environment maturity. There's a lot of that goes on, but we actually haven't gone beyond environment maturity and looked at, just gone in and done serious analysis of how you might relate those readiness measures to staff expertise. If we did a training program of staff in terms of supporting e-government, what would change? What do we need to do to upskill citizens? How would that affect the success of our e-government projects in the back office? How are we getting on in terms of service integration? What are the critical success factors? We, know, we really know very little about this. Even a systematic review of critical, trying to identify critical success factors and project development would be really very helpful. And then we need to link the back office through to the front office and so on. So that we've got, uh, we've got our web functionality related to the user's needs and, and not just according to what's the latest fashion in terms of web design. And then we can start measuring reduced cost of business compliance and higher levels of accuracy. And I would have to say that business compliance and G2B is one of the areas in which there have been the greatest number of successes um, in e-government globally. So we can look at quantitative methods based on objective measures which may or may not be derived from benchmarking, productivity, official accounts, statistics, uptake, reduction and failure. We can include analysis of documentation. It doesn't all have to be done through user studies. We've got survey research for accept user needs, acceptability, satisfaction, and to some extent outcomes, but we've actually got to do some sound methodological ones. What you tend to do, I mean, there, there was, it's very interesting actually, the, um, there have been some good, random, not RCTs, but randomised, um, random surveys, you know, random selection of a population. At least they've got generalisability on their side of how many people are using e-government. But the questions are often very imprecise, and I think there's a lot more work to be done there about what people want and, and what are the developments they would want to see. So we have got those sorts of survey research which can be helpful bearing in mind about reliability and validity. We can study a single point in time, we can study a cohort over time, we can do a study and control group. We can put one set of business people onto a comp online compliance and measure how long it takes them to do it, how many errors, how much cost saving there is compared with a group which continue with the manual system. You know, and, and until we do this, instead of just introducing, okay, you can do it online, you can do it on paper, you can do it online, right, from next year you've all got to do it online, there's no measurement going on. And so we slow down and do it. It's not going to happen. 
And the other thing I observed, there's a lot of web-based user, user surveys around. As was commented yesterday, these are getting increasingly unreliable because you know nothing about the population responding. And, and so they have no generalizability at all. And we've got we can use web metrics much better. I mean, we've got our benchmarking for international web metrics, like the Brown University studies, but we have to be aware of cultural bias. We've got usability measures. Again, that's, that's a kind of expert. That's your level five. Experts have decided on what the heuristics are and the guidelines and so on. Most guidelines come out of that. The WC3 accessibility guidelines, which I hope all your library websites comply with, they're a bunch of ex expert stuff. Maybe we should do a bit more testing it and get it up in terms of levels. Our, our EU and, and uh, UK best value measures. Oh, sorry. Didn't mean to do that. Um, also, a kind of web metrics. We could use log analysis much better. I mean, uh, this is starting to happen in libraries, transactional analysis. Very few government websites do this really, looking at their visitors, their page hits, the routes through the system where people get stuck, their exits, emergency exits when they leave before completion, time for task completion, we need far more studies along that. Um, just in passing I noticed the, the General Accounting Office of the US, which sits I think within the Office of Management and Budget, they have some web metrics which they expect to see used, number of visitors, number of comments submitted, saving time for business compliance, that's a good one, but why does the number of comments submitted measure, what does it measure? Why should you measure it? You know, where is the evidence behind this about the significance of these sorts of measures being used? Number of downloads? I suppose, yes, but what's the target? Percentage of people using online transactions versus paper? That's quite good. We could be setting targets there. That's a serious measure. So you get this grab bag that's sitting out there that's currently being used, and I think we could improve it much better. Qualitative measures have their place, including narrative, often more useful for formative evaluation or to lead to the definition of questions that you could put using quantitative methods. Data collection can involve focus groups, in-depth interviews, scenarios. Peter and I use scenarios and observations, found that quite helpful, threw up heaps of problems and websites that we, none of the government agencies involved knew existed. They'd never done it never watched anybody try and find something on their website. They just knew they weren't getting much use. But the, actually finding out why and what the problem was and how they could fix it hadn't occurred to them. And I think if you get, get data collection, which is well, well targeted and triangulated, that, that's really very effective. And we were very pleased that our, all our focus group work actually was beautifully validated by the um, randomised telephone survey that, was, that took place afterwards um, that really um, suggested that, that, that we'd been on the right track and we were picking up the right issues. But again, we've got to do far more of this work. We've, we've actually got to look through case studies trying to do some kind of systematic review. The data isn't there to do a proper systematic review, but if you went through the case studies looking for what worked, what didn't work, and tried to tabulate and pull it together, we would have some data, at least for process benchmarking, um, and we'd be reaching something that you might call evidence. And then we've got our expert review panel. Many of these things are based on that. So how well do they fit the evidence-based model? Well, not very well yet. We could. We're not really likely to get to level 1, A, B and C, but we might actually get the all or none type study if we found our own version of that. And that might be something that people in this room could think about in their own domain. People 2 and 3, I think we can. I think this is actually quite a good model to put to government and, and I really want to put this paper out there into the government sector so they can think about it, but I'm going to have to write more and explain these things more to them, how they would do it. I think systematic reviews of homogeneous research would be very valuable. Cohort studies are possible, case control studies are feasible. So we need to actually define for government suitable research methods. And the model itself, well, 
it seems to me that we go back to that term, the judicious use of evidence, to Greenhalgh's vision of balancing objectivity and su subjectivity, we can actually find out far more about what our citizens need and want and respond to it. Because these are not areas in which there is a huge agenda coming out of a party political system that, that defines the difference between the right and the left. They are actually areas in which it's quite clean and easy to go and ask about user preferences and do continuous evaluation to make sure the systems are giving a good return on investment. It also enables us to consider the preferences of other stakeholders in the business, from, from governments of the day to senior executives within government to citizens to business and so on. And I think this would actually enable us to blend science and politics if we started introducing some of these notions into government. And I think that's more e-democracy than actually having some kind of online poll of citizens on what they think on a particular issue. This is really responding. And I think it's the only way we're actually going to get to transformation in citizen-centric e-government. We have got to listen to our users, start collecting evidence, start using some of these research models to see what works, what doesn't, so I, I thought, having come across that model of Constelli and Vintar, that we had something there we could actually take the thing apart, deconstruct, and start looking at where we could put the investigative studies in. And it might even be something that you could think about within our own world, because the library in some ways is a bit of a black box too. It just sits there. You know, We don't actually deconstruct and look at... And in fact, when I was thinking that, I went right back to one of the earliest studies of library performance measurement that I also thought was extremely good, the studies by Paul Cantor, where he had Mav Cat and Mav this, and, and he analysed why is cataloguing held up here? What is the reason? Why is the reader not able to find the book in the catalogue? He had about four reasons. That was the kind of model we're talking about. And that work came and it, and it just really, nobody really adopted it, it just got bypassed. And I always thought it was a brilliant piece of work. And it must be now 30, 40 years old. And I recommend you go back and have a look at it actually. And that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Deconstruct, look where we can say, ah, this intervention here has this kind of impact on the next stage. This intervention here has this kind of impact on users. And then I think we'll get transformation. So I was very pleased to find a theoretical framework that seemed to work. Um, I'd be very interested in your comments about it and maybe how it applies to evaluation and library and information services. Thank you. question was, Google offers a very good search of US government websites, and, and I actually think that the, the US government websites are really probably a, a kind of international benchmark model for um, searching across, even if you just go on to the, the um, what's called FISGov itself. Um, is, is there any international model of that kind? And I'm certainly not aware of any international model of that kind, and that's partly because of this language thing that in every jurisdiction, um, the names of government agencies and the names of the functions that they perform is different. In, in New Zealand, we have a system of, um, we have two thesauruses managed by Archives New Zealand. One is functions of New Zealand and the other is subjects of New Zealand that are supposed to define all government activity. And we have a portal which is supposed to be that kind of um, discovery portal. And it's a dog's breakfast, it's hopeless, you can't find a thing. <laughs> it's actually quite interesting looking at government portals and some portals have, have started to go about how does this, what does the citizen want to know. The UK government portal is very interesting because it's defined everybody's life in terms of small events, having a baby, going on holiday, thinking about retirement and so on. And in all that happening it was really, really hard ever to find the old really good solid policy stuff and legislation. <laughs> 
because we're only supposed to want, you know, they've, mis they, they've tried to find citizens' roles and they've forgotten about the serious research or the person interested in democracy. So uh, uh, that's really the heart, of the, pro heart of, <coughs> sorry, the heart of the problem is interoperability is actually about semantics, not when we've got that sorted, then there might be a global search engine. Do they talk about evidence-based practice uh, in the government? Like, do they, like it's coming into our field, right? We've finally seen the light and we realize we have to have our own evidence-based practice in library and information science. But in, in the government, do they talk about we've got to become more evidence-based in how we do things? Has it sort of filtered in at that sort of level? Well, the, the term has filtered in. And I, I went, when I was first putting this talk together, I wanted to say something about that. I could find nothing actually happening, so I left it out. I'm, I'm really interested in knowing today what happens with evidence-based social work. I know that in education they're trying to do evidence-based and I mean sometimes there are examples out there. We had in New Zealand a reading recovery program that's become quite globally renowned because it was so successful in the number of children that taken out of class at six and given individual tuition. I mean, not rocket science, you know, kids benefit from individual tuition when they're learning to read, but at least it was identifying them and preventing continuing failure. So that I think that there are programs which are based on evidence but they're not yet labelled that and I think that the rhetoric in the policy agencies about evidence they don't have the search and analysis skills they need to actually do it and I don't think the research is there because of the problems I've been outlining. Well I guess I've noticed it more in uh, certain Canada to a certain extent evidence-based policy and especially you know, health care policy there seems to be uh, the policy making but that's only one part of government services mm. to citizens is an entirely other part of mm. what they're doing with e-government, right? So it's kind of, a, it may even have to be dissected even a bit more to figure out, yeah. and it may filter in through different kinds of activities of government, maybe starting with the policy and then coming in more to the consumer services. services well, I mean, I think that the academic community does a lot of research about how effective our services in this area. You know, we've got our Health Services Research Centre at Victoria, which looks at, OK, there was a change in government administration of health services in the past decade. How has that impacted on health outcomes and the burden of disease in the community? You know, and so there are attempts to measure it. And I, and, and I think that they could legitimately say they were looking for evidence in the, in the best models they can. So you, it's just hard to identify where it's actually happening and is it useful or not. I don't know. Yeah, just a, a quick comment on that point and then the point I was going to make. Uh, in the UK, the Cabinet Office has been trying to coordinate uh, evidence-based approaches across governmental sectors, and they've produced uh, a famous Progenta book, which is about evaluation of government initiatives, and so that perhaps corresponds to the sort of thing that, uh, that Joanne's asking about. But uh, again, particularly in the UK government, whether that's... Uh, uh, actuality or rhetoric, I can't be sure. Um, but the, the, the point I was going to make is that thank you for a fascinating presentation brought two very interesting strands together. Um, uh, but it is struck, struck me that uh, some of the approaches being looked at um, uh, by, for example, Ray Horson, who's got this uh, method called realistic evaluation, which is trying to use methods of review, but review of different evidence. So, for example, your case study or your user survey may help you to think why something might work, and then process evaluations might help you to unpick the processes, and then some outcomes might help you to um, see whether that those um, uh, intended benefits or indeed unintended benefits were realised. And, and certainly the book that he's published within the last 12 months seems to me transferable both to what you're saying about e-government and, and potentially transferable to us who are looking at programs of library services and why they might work in one setting and not in another. Yes, I think that's an interesting comment and I unfortunately can't summarise the whole of it, but I, I suspect that what's, what's actually happening in government is there, and there are pockets and agencies where there is quite good quality research going on and they're trying to read seriously, but one of the hopes of e-government is that you will get greater transparency within agencies and that they will talk to each other more. It, like, you know, it took us a long time to realise that catalogues ought to talk to the reference people and, 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 and the front desk people. 
and we're still struggling with that. And it's exactly the same in a government agency. You're in this unit or you're in that unit. And, and they don't actually pull together very well to see how they can look at impacts. You know, and this is kind of back office stuff where we're just not getting good coordination. And so that this whole vision of transformation and within government cooperation and standardisation of databases and terms is, is about people and culture. And the, the, the big variable, you see, is, is the elected government at the top that mucks it up <laughs> and restructures them and gives them different agendas all the time. So it, it is actually a difficult problem to do. But and I think there is small progress being made. If, if I understand you correctly, and it's a little hard to hear, you're asking how much involvement I have with government, and if they actually listen to any of the things that we're doing. Um, actually, it, because it's a new field, and it, we're all newbies, and we're all finding out as we go, it's quite easy for people involved in e-government research to be talking to their governments all the time. And I noticed this in, in a number of countries, including in Europe and the UK and the US, and, for example, when the government at the end of 2005 wanted to put out a report on how it was going, an e-government, and it's a very imperfect report, but you can look at it on the e-government website, which is e.gov.nz. Um, it's called Achieving e-government, and it cites hugely the work that Peter and I had done. It also cites a web, another web, web analysis study and the, um, the survey and it looks at a range of ways of evaluating it. It's not as rigorous as I would have hoped. You know, I think they should have taken our research and gone further. They tend to highlight success stories here and success stories there in different agencies to say we're getting somewhere. But yes, they did use that research. And, and I'm currently engaged with them on a quite a big project about e-participation and, and we, we designed it together. And that report will go up on their website. And I supervised a young Fulbright from America, a um, student uh, a year or so ago who carried out a piece of research under my supervision but their definition on breaches of privacy and its impact on trust in government which they wanted to know about. So I, I think we're in a very fortunate position here in this new field that we are working with government and interacting with government and it's actually quite exciting. time frame for evaluating in government. There are different drivers, I think. I mean, you, you wouldn't ask how long does a time frame of a clinical trial take um, in first stage, second stage and third stage clinical trials. Um, and, and we probably have to start thinking in terms of, okay, let's do an initial piece of work and then let's broaden it out to a wider group of people. Um, because these rigorous medical models are useful thinking about evaluating an intervention. But at the same time, governments have their reporting requirements. They file annual reports in Parliament, most government agencies, or in some form or other. And, and, and they, I think, are, are being required to do annual reporting. But if you could get some baseline data, get them a method that they could actually use each year, we could actually start to track some progress. Mm. And I think that might be a useful contribution to make, as well as doing less time critical research for them. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much.
today when we really wanted to explore the application or lack thereof of 